and we should be live. So welcome everyone who's joining. Uh, I'm excited today because I have with me, uh, he is called MJ, the fellow actuary on YouTube. So welcome, MJ. Hello, hello. And Joe, thank you so much for, for having me on your channel. Yes, um, for sure. Just, just, just like a quick little shout because I'm going to be copying this video and putting it on my YouTube channel as well. So to my subscribers, if you're watching it through this, I will be putting a link to Paul's channel because he's interviews a lot, lot of actories and he's got some great content. So make sure you yeah. guys check him out. So thank, thank you, MJ. Yeah, I appreciate it. And then to everyone on my channel, uh, you'll have to check out MJ. I'm going to put some links to his stuff at the end of my video. But uh, again, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. MJ is a is a, an actuarial freelancer and he does some YouTubing and a lot of interesting stuff, which we're going to kind of dive into. Uh, so let's just start off with just, uh, could you just introduce yourself a couple sentences maybe of what you do and then we'll kind of dive in. So yeah, I mean, my, my name is MJ um, or Michael Jordan, although because I keep getting the, the basketball jokes. I, I uh, was going to, I was going to actually <laughs> ask you about that. If you get that a lot. Oh, all the time, all the time. Yeah, so much so I that I, I just revert to, to MJ, um, yeah. you know, as, as a nice little nickname nice. and you know, you, you kind of summed it up quite well. Uh, I fun, finally finished studying actuarial science and I'm a bit of a freelancer slash consultant um, working on a few projects. And the lovely thing about this is every year or so, you know, I get something else to do. So I don't get too bored doing the same thing, um, which is what I like. But yeah, studied actuarial science and somehow managed to get through it. And that's where I find myself now. Good for you. That's awesome. So let's let's kind of back up, start from the beginning. I like to ask a lot of the guests this is um, mm -hmm. from a young age, were you interested in math or did that come later for you? Well, I mean, it's it's interesting because the, the parents always used to used to tell me the story that when I was, you know, when I was, before I was born, um, you know, the ultrasounds showed that I potentially was going to have brain damage. So when oh, I was wow. born. Yeah, you know, when I was born, fortunately, there was nothing wrong. But my grandmother was super concerned about this whole brain damage scare. So the story is that she used to like overstimulate me whenever I would go to grandma's house. You know, always playing games like little puzzle games. You know, put the shape in this little box. You know, and it was like it was almost like I had this tutor from the day I was born because she was so worried that you know maybe I was going to be brain damaged, so she had to overstimulate me. Wow. And then. Put that with the whole thing that my mother is a maths teacher, and you can see that growing up, education became very much a focus. Yeah, so, yeah. So I kind of had an unfair advantage in, in <laughs> that side, um, where yeah, I had the had the mom helping me and the grandmother, you know, giving me all this early tuition. And apparently, my, my mom told me that because I'm a December baby, and in South Africa we start school, you know the cutoff is normally January. So if you're born, you know, depending what year, that's the year you go into. Okay. Yep. So because I was on the border, they sent me to like a psychologist for an assessment. Like, can I actually go into the first grade? And I think this was when I was age five or age six. And the psychologist said that I was operating at the mental ability of a nine-year-old, which I put down to my, my grandmother's early stimulation. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I kind of got a little bit of a head start in, in that side. That's awesome. Um, so did you did you actually hear about the actuarial profession profession from your mom since she was a math teacher or when did you first hear about that? You know, it, it's it's interesting because I was looking at my like my school records the other day. My mom used to love and you know keep everything. And you know, when we had a career day, they you know filled in this form and it was like, you know, what career paths do you want to do? And being a child, the two that I put forward was either a religious preacher or a sports, you know, manager, you know, for football or something like that. Really? Wow. That's two, you know, the, two you know, <laughs> ends of the spectrum there. <laughs> two, two ends of the spectrum, but those were like my two top choices. And then in the bottom, I, I saw the report came back and it said, you know, this child has attributes that would play well for accountant, actuary, um, you know, engineer. So it, it was interesting that actually was picked up quite early on. Wow. But, you know, I was so young. I mean, I don't remember that report. I don't think the parents took, you know, those early career assessments too seriously, especially when I'd said religious uh, preacher. Uh, <laughs> what what did the they parents, think of that? <laughs> my, my mom always said to me, um, and I think my dad was also on the same boat, they were very much saying that I had to get into a profession. They yeah. said, if I went straight into preaching, 
you know, people would see me as a bit of like a dropout. So they said, you first have to become a, a wow. qualified profession, either a lawyer, accountant or something. And then you can go do your sports management or religious teaching. So no, no they, they very much pushed me towards a profession. Although when the time came for me to do actuarial science, um, then they were very hesitant. They were like, oh no, we've heard people who do this don't have a social life and it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. You know, rather rather do accounting or or something like that uh which my brother had done and which i was going to do uh but because i did well at school you know everyone was saying you did well at school you must do actuarial science or just consider it and i kind of liked the fact that it was a challenge you know yeah. it's, especially here in south africa it's got that stigma of being the most challenging degree yeah and i was like you know i did well at school so i was like oh, i can do it you know i had i had a little bit of that that arrogance um, which of well, course you are, first, you are as smart as a nine year old at age six. So, I mean, <laughs> you got it right there. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it was interesting because like my, my mom only told me that story much later because throughout primary school, um, I wasn't like top of the class. I was, yeah. you know, I did all right, but I wasn't top of the class. It was only when I went into to high school that they started posting our marks on a board, you know, and there was like a bit of a, a ranking system going that it became a bit of a game for me. And I was like, okay, I want to win this game that I really started pushing hard yeah, to come yeah. top of the class. And then it was also not just, I don't want to just become top of the class I want to become top of every single subject. Um, I failed to do that for actu uh, not actu uh, Afrikaans. So I'm terrible with languages. So <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get it for Afrikaans, but I got it for majority of the other subjects. And that's, you know, by doing like that, I got in the top 50 in the country. And of course, then you're wow. in the newspaper, and that's when everybody now starts saying, "Oh, your child's smart; they must do actuarial science." And that was so, all through like elementary, junior high, high school that you were in the top fifty, or so. So no, so they only do the top fifty in the final year. So we uh, we call our final year matric. Um, okay. I'm trying to think what they would call it uh, on your side, but it's when you're around 17, 17, okay. 18. Okay. Yeah, so um, it'd be it'd be kind of like your senior year of high school here before you go to college. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, yeah. and the whole idea there is before that, every uh, school would write their own internal exams. In matric, you write external exams that the whole country then writes. Um, and that is to make sure that schools don't issue matric uh, certificates by giving easy exams. Um, so it's standardized, and that's where they can then give the ranking. But of course, okay. I think. Uh, I then go into actuarial science, and this is a funny story because I, I go and thinking, you know, oh, I'm so smart, I'm top 50, look at me. Yeah, and I yeah. remember sitting, sitting next to this guy in, in like one of the first lectures and I was like, you know, look at him and I was like, bruh, I'm, I'm a top 50 student. <laughs> and, he, and he just, he looks at me and he smirks and he whips out his phone and he pushes it and it's a, it's a YouTube clip of him on the local news station with him being interviewed by an anchor that I, you know, was quite familiar, this local news person, and the ticker tape underneath was saying, this was the number one student in the no country. Way. <laughs> and that's when I was like, damn, like this thing, at school, like especially high school, I was getting top marks, I was getting 90s, I was excelling. Yeah. You hit actuarial science, and suddenly, you know, those 90% become 60%, and you go from being top in the class to no longer even in the top 10. Yeah, there were some really, really smart guys that I was up against. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a bit of a shock to the pride. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, I I know that that's kind of how it is. Like when you're younger and you're really smart, and then you get to high school, you're still good, and then college it might be a little different, and then actuarial it gets even different. It gets more and more competitive. I feel like when you go on. No, look, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit, I was crying like probably once a week just out of, <laughs> out of like frustration and I felt like such a failure because, you know, especially there was this one, there was this one actuarial notation. It was, uh, you know, S angle N. Yes. And I remember I just, it just didn't click. It just yeah. didn't click. I understood, you know, a present value of an annuity, but a future value but of future an annuity. Value, you know? Yeah. That, that just messed up my mind. I was like, why would anyone want to calculate the future mm -hmm. value of an annuity? And it just stuffed me up so badly. And I remember just crying, like being so frustrated. And then finally, one of the kids uh, in my class, you know, I remember he, he came over and he helped me understand it. You know, he really, you know, went through the whole thing and I really like got to grasp with it. But of course, to my horror, like a few months later, he dropped out. And oh, I was like, what's going on? Like that was the guy who was helping me. And now he's, he's yeah, tapped out of this thing. Wow. And the parents were always like, 
you know, if you want to quit, you can quit. You know, you can drop out any time you want. And I was like, no, I don't need that time. Yeah. I need, <laughs> I don't need comforting. I need motivation. Yeah, exactly. But, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, the first few years of actual science wow. were, That's tough. were, so, were difficult. So where did you go to school in South Africa then? So at school, I went to a, a Catholic school um, called St. Benedict's College. And of course, it was, it was very interesting because being Catholic and my family's religion was Pentecostal, oh, um, which is very much, you know, charismatic. And, you know, we had like a rock band at church where, you know, at the Catholic school, they still had like the little piano, maybe yeah, organs yeah. on special occasions. You know, so it, it was it was very interesting from a religious perspective going to, you know, the Catholic school. Um, but no, it was it was a brilliant school. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Funny story. I mean, we were we had one of the top basketball teams in the country, um, and the coach always used to therefore make the joke. You know, our school is so good at basketball that Michael Jordan doesn't even make the team. Ah, you know, yeah. we've got him, we've got him, but he doesn't even make. That's how how good we were. You know what? You know what's um, funny about that is uh, I did my undergrad degree at Gonzaga, uh, which in mm -hmm. the United States is a very good basketball school as well. So uh, okay, I can relate to you there. <laughs> no, I, I tried to play basketball once and the ball came and smacked me in the mouth and I actually chipped a tooth playing, Did it really? playing this game. It chipped oh, a tooth. Yeah. And that's when I was like, nah, this game's not for me. I'll You're stick like, nope. to chess. Yeah. So so I did chess at school. Um and yeah, that was kind of the peak of my sport. So is um, uh is South in South Africa are most colleges a four year degree? So it's it's interesting. I mean, at, at the University of uh, Wits, where I went to, it was a three-year undergrad, and then only if you got um, five of the actual exemptions did you then get invited into honors year. So oh, really? Get, getting invited into honors year was, you know, it wasn't like guaranteed that you're going to go to honors year. So that was a little bit tricky, whereas some of the other universities, they build it in. It's like it's a four-year uh, course and you know if you pass third year you automatically go into to honors year yeah of course this was a little bit easy on other sides so with this we broke up let's say actuarial science three into three separate modules and you just had to pass it overall whereas i see in some of the other universities you had to pass each and every model on its own if you you know if you got like 49 percent for the one and 51 for the other at this you'd go through at these other universities you'd have to repeat Okay. So, so yeah, so, and, and this is where it does get a little bit confusing for actuarial science in South Africa because even let's say at WITS, you can do something, you can do it through the Bachelor of Science or you can do it through the Bachelor of Economics. And okay. I remember as a student being like, I don't want to take physics and chemistry, you know, maybe I should do it through the Bachelor of Economics. Whereas the Bachelor of Economics was just added on additional subjects. And fortunately, I had someone warn me that said, you know, this degree is hard enough on its own. You don't want to be doing all these additional subjects on top of it. Right. So, but yeah, and I think that was one of the things going into university. I mean, I even had a brother. I had a, an older brother who had been to Wits, who was at Wits. He could tell me, you know, like, you don't, you don't come here to play. You come here to work, that type of thing. But I still didn't really know what was going on. And I think that's why a lot of guys do drop out because we see in the movies, especially, you know, the American movies, everyone having fun in college, you know, oh, university, yeah. one big yeah. party. <laughs> and then we get there and it's like, oh, flip, you know, there's exams and these exams yeah. are tough. Uh -huh. So I think, yeah, that also contributes to, to a big dropout rate is the fact that people just don't know what they're getting into when they start actuarial science. Or I guess so, any degree for, for that fact. Totally. I'm kind of curious. So do most people in South Africa that go into the actuarial profession, do most of them study that in school or do any, any of them study something completely different and then get into it later and take the exams later? Yeah. So, so how the schooling works here in South Africa is, so we don't have actuarial science yeah, as a subject at school. I mean, we don't even have economics as a, as a subject at school. Oh, what happens is we've got very like predefined subjects. And you then, the big thing is that in grade 10, so what, how old are you in grade 10? Like 16, 15, um, you make your subject choices. And so I chose um, IT, which is computers and programming. Um, and I chose accounting and I chose science. So those are the three subjects I chose along with your others, which is mathematics, uh, life orientation, uh, English, Afrikaans, and I also then did the extra ad advanced mathematics. Um, 
but yeah, you can choose to to drop maths, you can choose to drop science, um, and you can also do history, biology, or geography. But that kind of is it. You know, we we're very limited with the subjects that we can that we could choose from. But um, in in college, though, you said that you studied actuarial science, right? Or you were doing when you went off to uh, the university. Yes. Yeah, so, so so that's another thing in in South Africa. We we have school and then we have university. We don't have a, a college and in between. Oh, okay. See, I, yes. I'm calling. Uh, I'm I'm using the term university and college uh, in place of each other. So I should be more clear. University, because sometimes in America we have colleges and we have universities, but they are both the college level. So yes. you have you have to be at a certain point to become a university, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So sorry. No, no, I, I should I should have clarified. I meant you. No, it, it, it's horribly confusing because my, my school's full name is St. Benedict's College. Oh, OK. okay. I, so, I get it. No, no, it, I, it, gets, it gets very confusing. I, yeah, I was. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I was not clear there. I, what I meant was, do most people study actuarial science at the university level? Yes. Yes. Most people okay. study um, yeah, at the university level. Uh, there, yeah. are, there are a few people who maybe study engineering or accounting or statistics and then start doing the actuarial exams once they're in the working world. You know, they'll sometimes get a degree in, let's say, mathematical statistics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then they start working for an insurance company. They start seeing that the actuaries are treated like gold and they yep. like stuff that we want to write the exams. We can do this. You know, we want to get that, that special treatment and that bump that's, in, in salary. That's why, so, that's kind of why I was wondering because, uh, a, a lot of people traditionally, at least in the United States, uh, would major in math or statistics or something like that mm -hmm. at the university level and then go on and take actuarial exams while you're working at a company. In fact, that's what I did. But mm -hmm. more and more actuarial programs have popped up. Yes. And now it's becoming very common in the United States for universities to have an actuarial science degree that people go through. And they end up taking a lot of exams while they're in school which I think mm -hmm. is nice because like for me, it was like I studied a whole math degree. And then when I was out, then it was a whole bunch more exams while I was mm -hmm. working. So, um, so that, that's, that's interesting. That's like for you, when you got through school, were you done with the exams or did you have quite a bit more to do while after so, you got out? So it was interesting. So in first year, um, I was able to get the, the economics exemption and the accounting exemption. So those were two very easy subjects. Yeah. Um, but actuarial science uh, and statistics, you know, I kind of struggled with, you know, those were the ones I was like 60% type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Se yeah, yeah, yeah. Second year comes along and to get the, um, the, the financial maths exemption, you needed, I think it was a little bit of first year and a little bit of second year. And same with statistics, you needed a little bit of first year and a little bit of second year. And that's what made it a little bit complicated. But I remember stats second year was, oh, that was dreadful. I was getting sometimes 25% for an exam. Uh, oh, for the that's exam. <laughs> and, and that's why when I got my final mark, my final mark of like 55%, yeah. again, I cried. I cried a lot at university. Um, very <laughs> it was emotional. an emotional time. <laughs> it was an emotional time. Um, so yeah, I was just so happy to, to pass you know, statistics. So 55 for me was brilliant. You'd needed 60 in order to get the exemption. Okay. Um, a lot of other subjects, I mean, like survival models, I got 59% for, um, or financial maths, I got 58% for. So yes. these ones I, I would have to redo at a later stage. Right. And it started becoming a little bit problematic because like I said, you needed five exemptions in order to get into your honors year. And I got two in the first year, I got nothing in the second year. Oh, wow. Fortunately for me, third year comes along and I start dating a girl whose sister was studying at Cheryl Science and she was the year above me. And she kind of introduced me to the, the Act Ed notes or, you know, these online textbooks and just other resources and gave me yep. some of her notes. And that helped a lot. That helped a lot because, you know, Vitz, Vitz is great and all, but sometimes, you know, we had lecturers who weren't that good with English. We had this French guy. So he had a PhD in statistics. Yeah. He's a very smart guy, but he couldn't really speak English. Well, he, he could speak English, but I really struggled with the accent. So I didn't That's understand yeah. anything. Yeah. I didn't understand anything going on in that lecture. Fortunately, I could get her notes. I could get her books. And I was able to get, you know, which, which exemptions did I get? I got CT7, 
Oh no, is it C sorry, CT6, CT8. Um, and I got another one because I managed to get five. Oh, and I got the communications exemption, we, which is oh, CA3. Nice. Although they've changed the names of all the subjects now, so I don't even know why I'm yeah, yeah, referencing yeah. this. Because in, in America, you guys you guys use different. It, it's different all different. It's well. all different. Yeah, but they. It's I mean, all. Even here in America, they they keep changing the exams. I mean, they're, it's all similar subjects, but they just mm -hmm. like change around the exams every ten years or so. So it's like yeah, they now this all the names are different. That. Yeah. yeah. But Josh, so I, I somehow managed to get three exemptions right at the final exam session of third year. So I just snuck into honors. Like I was, I like wow, just good, good for you. So you got that final year then, which enabled you yes. to study more actuarial exams at that point. Yes, which allowed me to go into honors year where we did the big exam called CA one, which is called actuarial risk management, um, okay. which is seen by many as the hardest actuarial exam. And the reason why it's the hardest actuarial exam is because it's finance, it's pensions, it's life, it's general, it's health, it's banking, it's everything. Yes. And it's a written exam. It's not like a calculation exam. Right. And so there's just so much to learn. So remember, we the first half of honors is just dedicated to, to the subject. And this is actually when I started making my YouTube videos. Um, well, I didn't, I didn't post these ones on YouTube, uh, but I started making video study notes for myself. Okay. So each chapter I turned into a video study note just so that while I was eating, I could watch myself learning. I could try hear, see, and I had all these pretty pictures. I think I've got some of the notes. I lost, I lost a lot of the videos, um, but a good, I mean, I think there's around 10 or so of these videos I did manage to put onto to YouTube. Um, and they were like, yeah, my very first attempt at making video study notes. And then another thing I did for CA1, because like I said, it was it was just too much and I was really struggling with it. I decided to take all the past papers, all the past papers, and plot them against the syllabus objectives and start, you know, marking when, you know, okay, back in this year they asked this question, back in this year they asked this syllabus objective, back here they asked this. And it was amazing because a pattern formed. A clear pattern formed where if they asked one syllabus objective the previous year, they never asked it the following year. There was never a repeat yeah, yeah. of the syllabus objectives. And then there was also some syllabus objectives that would oscillate. So they would always ask one or the other. And you could see this clear oscillation pattern happening. Interesting. So I kind of looked at this stuff and I was like, well, look, the subject is really difficult. And we, we had a month before the exam off to, to study for it. You know, it's supposed to be a holiday, but it's, you know, you get the holiday before the big exam. Right. Which, you know, most people just used to study. And remember that being a tough month. That was, you know, were you pushing eight to 10 hours of studying every day? You know, yeah. it, was, it was intense. And so I used my, my spotted notes, you know, what syllabus objectives I thought were going to pop up in the exam. And ta da, they were there in the exam. So I went from being like at the bottom of honors class, I think I got the fourth highest mark. For, for that exam. And everyone was very right. confused. They were like, they were like this kid just scraped in, you know, and <laughs> out of the class of 20, he went from like last place to fourth. You know, how, how did that happen? That's amazing. Um, and then, you know, and then the second part of honors, you choose which subjects you want to study. So I chose finance and general insurance. And finance was, I found quite easy, quite straightforward. So I got the exemption for that. Um, whereas general insurance went like right over my head, like there, okay. the, the maths was at another level and, uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't manage to get that exemption. So yeah, so I came out of university with how many exemptions that five and then got the CA one and the finance. So I came out with seven exemptions. So when you come out with an exemption, that basically means that the society of actuary, or the society of actuaries in South Africa considers you to have passed that exam and then you yes. still have to take the other ones. Okay. Yes. So, okay. and, and it was so weird like, going out of the exams and then having to read write, you know, some of the, the earlier ones. So I had to write um, financial maths again, which is CT1. I had to write uh, subject CT3, statistics. I had to write, um, what, I had to write quite a few, but they were, it was weird. They were very straightforward. Like, off, like at university, they are very difficult. After university, they're quite straightforward. But what I started doing was I continued the video note method, you know, where I was making video notes for yes. myself. And this kind of is where I think the YouTube channel, because I then started posting a lot of these onto YouTube on a consecutive basis. So on my channel, you've got 
all the financial maths exams, uh, sorry, all the financial maths syllabus, all the life contingencies uh, syllabus as well. So you've got yeah. two complete courses that I was making while I was studying for those exams. And I think that kind of gave my channel just the bulk content or that core content for it to get a little bit of a following. Um, of course, I would then go in and make you know a bunch of stupid videos, which I watch back now and I cringe so hard. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> did I make that? I you, mean, you, I gotta, about, you gotta leave those I, out there though, because then you can see your full story over the years. <laughs> yes, I think I've got one video out there which I call the, the five myths of the actuarial exam. And I think the last myth, I, I even I made it up. I said something about, if you get 100% for the actuarial exams, so you get invited into the Illuminati. And I don't know why, but this, <laughs> this video does better than all the tutorial ones. It is so cringy. It is just so bad. And I'm just like, oh, you know, if anybody just types my name in, on YouTube, they're going to see these cringy I, videos first. I, I'm pretty sure I saw that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So, but, yeah, I get that, that is the interesting thing about YouTube is, you know, you can make a video where you discuss, um, you know, like some really heavy piece of, of the syllabus going to like a lot of depth and you'll maybe get like 200 300 views of people who are actually looking for that yes but no one's just going to want to watch that you know if they're having lunch or they're just chilling and i think that's where the stupid videos people you know you sometimes just get people who are procrastinating they'll maybe watch those totally so totally. so it's i always like, wanted to like tell entertainment them, yes that entertainment and that's why yeah. there was there was a big temptation to to just keep making silly videos and I had to tell myself, I was like, listen, yeah, you know, getting a lot of subscribers is nice. You know, it's nice to get a lot of subscribers and it's nice to get a lot of views. But I tried to tell myself, I didn't want to chase that. I didn't want to be the person who was forever chasing views, yes. chasing yes. subscribers by making, you know, entertainment. Because one, I don't think I'm that good at it. You know, I don't think I can compete with, you know, the, the Logan Pauls and, and those tough guys of <laughs> YouTube. Um, so I, I'll try to say, you know what, let me keep my content, let's keep the majority of it serious, but then every now and again have a, a fun or, or silly video, uh, which is weird because the, the silly videos do do the best. Like my latest silly video was actuarial science versus accounting or actuaries oh, yeah. versus accounting. Yeah. And that one also, that does much better than, you know, how to calculate the moment generating function of the exponential distribution. You know, yes. like that content gets completely wiped compared to the I think ones. that can be that can be good though because it provides a little variety you know you get a little bit of entertainment and then you get some of the serious videos as well yeah so well, look, look I think I think that the silly videos have also helped a lot in growing the channel because you know yeah I find people on YouTube they'll only watch a video if it has a certain number of views right, right. If, if your videos got let's say 50 50 views people are going to be less, you know, like, should I watch this? Whereas yep. if the video's got 5.5 million views, people are like, oh, damn, I need to see this. You know, what is everybody yeah. checking out? And then, exactly. you know, that, that snowball effect starts happening. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's been a good way to bring people into the channel. But I am very aware that, yeah, I don't want to come across as too cringy or too, too silly. Because I, I have got comments where people are like, this guy's an idiot, you know, or this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so, you know, you, you don't yeah. want to get too many of, of you got to You got to just, you got to ignore the haters, though, you know. <laughs> there, there's always going to be haters. <laughs> no, yeah, fair enough. Fair yeah. Enough. But, uh, so I'm, uh, that was actually kind of my next question, and you answered is how you got started with this whole YouTubing thing. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you just really put, put those study notes out there. And that's that you started getting views, you started getting subscribers and thought, hey, there might be something to this. I'll keep making videos. At that point, was it um, was there any motivation and keep going? Was it fun for you or was it something that helped you in any way? I'm just curious, like kind of how it kept going. So it, it was interesting. I mean, because I, I played around with the, the monetizing the videos, you know, where I put the little ads on before. Yeah, and I was very curious to see how that thing works. And I mean, the videos, they don't generate that much. They, they, they make what? what I'm trying to think what it's in in dollars. They, they make around $80 a month, uh, okay. the videos yeah. in, in monetization, which is nice pocket change, but, you know, it's nothing that you can, you can't live off $80 a, yeah, a month. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, the, you know, like I said, so the channels were never made, you know, it wasn't never to try and become, you know, this a full-time job. Um, it was very much, like I said, I made the videos initially because they helped myself and I put them online and I saw that they helped others. And then I made one or two more videos because, you know, people were requesting, oh yeah, I did that for quite a while where I'd ask people, what do you want me to talk about? And then people would give me video requests and I would make it. But my uploading is very sporadic and I know that's bad for growing an audience. You know, you want to have 
consistent content, you know, releasing right, right. every Tuesday at nine o'clock. You, you know, you want to create a bit of like a habit. But I also didn't want the YouTube video to be too time consuming. Like, you know, with actuarial signs, there's a lot of other things that demand our time, you know, right, studying exactly. work and all these other things. So I wanted to always keep the YouTube video like alive, but I didn't want to become like a slave to it. Not like, oh, I have to now release, you know, and right. release right. bad content just for the sake of releasing content. Um, but having said that, I mean, the YouTube video has been very, very strategic or very important with my current career now. It's the way a lot of clients find me. It's a way that I can prove that I know what I know. Um, because, you know, it's one thing telling someone, oh, you're in this profession or you have this degree. And they're like, okay, that's cool. But it's another thing for them to actually see, oh, wow, you've got a library where you're talking and discussing this stuff. Okay, you probably do know what, what you mean by this. Yes. So from a career move, it's probably been very beneficial. And I'm probably still going to be reaping a lot of the, you know, the fruit from it uh, for the years to come. That was um, good. Yeah. And that's what I was kind of curious about because I know you do, we talked a little bit and you do some consulting kind of on the side. Uh, you also have a Udemy course as well. And I'm <laughs> sure having a YouTube channel has helped create connections for those other things. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about what you do other than the YouTube? So, yeah, I mean, like the, the one thing is the Actuarial Society of South Africa. Um, they contacted me and they're like, look, you make these YouTube videos. Do you mind making some for, for us? So I've actually made, um, so like I said, CT1 and CT5, which is financial maths and life contingencies on the, yeah. are on the yeah. YouTube platform. They then got me to make survival models and advanced statistics, so CT4 and CT6. And okay. they actually did a whole bunch of exam walkthroughs and did a whole bunch of things for their private um, ASA academy. Um, so that was quite cool because then it was, I was making uh, you know, videos still on actuarial science, but this time I was getting paid to do them for the actuarial society. Oh, that's so, cool. so that was one direct job that came from, from the YouTube videos. Um, the other thing is like now I help out with the actuarial society. I give workshops on enterprise risk management and, you know, do these other things for them, which they pay for. And the students, they're like, oh, yeah, we like this guy because we've seen him, you know, on YouTube. Yeah, so yeah. so from, from that point of view, it's been, it's been great. Um, but then just on, on the other side, um, like when I qualified as a fellow in 2018, um, at the end of 2018, I got contacted by an actuary in London. And she was down here for the South African convention. She said, can we meet for coffee? And originally she just wanted to kind of give an interview, you know, how I'm using technology to teach. You know, that's basically what it was about. But after coffee, we got to know each other. She explained her vision, how she wants to combine actuarial science with technology. And I was told her, you know what, I love technology. I love AI, I love blockchain. You know, I don't understand it all too well, but <laughs> it, it is something that has, has piqued my curiosity. I noticed you have some stuff on blockchain on your channel too. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so I was like, well, you know, I am curious about this stuff. And she yeah. said, well, you know what, should, would you be interested if I, you know, if she has overcapacity uh, or, you know, she, she runs out of capacity, would she mind passing one or two clients to myself? Um, or, you know, I can maybe work under her banner or something like that. And that's very much where this thing called Actuar Tech is coming from. So you'll see on some of like my new upcoming videos, we'll put Actuar Tech as like kind of like the sponsor. Okay. Um, and we trying to, and we've been hosting events, and we've been throwing breakfast or having you know cocktail evenings, and we're trying to build this Actuar Actuar Tech community uh, here in South Africa and also where she is in London, um, with the whole idea of using technology to address traditional actuarial problems, and the. The whole way I got connected with that was because she, she identified, oh, here's a guy using technology to teach actuarial science. Let's meet up with him. And then that meeting led to, to this, which That's has been, awesome. very benef yeah, been very beneficial because also she's bringing a lot of overseas clients to me. And especially with the South African exchange rate, the, the overseas clients are, you know, we're cheap. South African actuaries are quite cheap compared to, you know, you guys and, and everybody else in the world. <laughs> so, so they do favor us. Uh, you know, we do have that, that price. Um, wow. Know, that's in interesting. So the client she's bringing you, are you doing actuarial like finance yes. type work for them or are you doing teaching type stuff for them? 
No, no, no. So, so th this is more like your, your bread and butter actuarial work. Okay, so okay. Uh, I yeah. built, built a funeral model on this new actuarial platform that is like 10,000 times quicker than, you know, Prophet or Moses or the old, you know, technology. Oh, wow. Um, and they're looking to expand, you know, go really aggressive here in South Africa. So, you know, we had a couple of meetings with some big actuarial firms here. And they, you know, we might even look at building a modeling team. So I might... And then again, that's where I can use the YouTube channel. I can make a YouTube channel and say, hey, guys, I need four young actuaries based in Cape Town who want to do modeling. That's you know, awesome. Hit me up. Let's do it. So you, and you don't you're, you're really kind of all over the place. It's kind of amazing that uh, having this, people kind of know your name and know you that you know what you're talking about. And then mm -hmm. it's led to so many different things like this. Well, yeah, and that's, I think that that's, that's the whole – and this is, like I said, why the parents were so obsessed with me getting into the profession because they said – the profession gives you credibility. You know, yeah. when you go and you say something, uh, my, my dad was a lawyer, so he kind of saw that firsthand. You know, by being in that profession, you just, you don't have to always prove yourself. You don't always have to say, oh, you know, look at my CV, look at all, you know, this yeah, stuff. Yeah. It kind of just falls into place. Of course, the actual profession, it's a bit of an interesting one because there are some people who know what it is and they're like, wow, you're smart. And there's some people who don't know what you are at all. You tell them, oh, I'm an actuary. And they're like, what? You studied <laughs> agricultural science. You know, they think you're a farmer. Yes. Um, yes. That would and be most, people, most people. Yeah. And then, then there's other people who, even like, let's say, in the finance space, you know, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a CFA. And I'm like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an actuary. And they're like, what does an actuary do? And I'm like, you know, it's, it's quite interesting that even in, like they say, financial circles, Right. Actually, right. pe people know that we're smart, but we, they don't really know what we do. And I guess that's because, you know, you ask an actually what they do. They do have to sit down and explain, you know, what yes. exactly it yes. is because there are so many different things that we could be doing. So, totally. But, totally. but no, look, I mean, the YouTube channel has been, has been a major blessing. And it's weird how, you know, I made this thing to like, like I said, it was first to help me put it online. It did help some people. Um, and then seeing that that has paid back in the future, it kind of, you know, it, it almost shines a little bit of a like, a, like a world truth. You know, if you are nice to people today, you know, yes. something nice will happen to you tomorrow. But there, there is that time gap, you know, it's, it's kind of, yeah. That's, so, no, that's awesome. And then uh, the fact that the Society of Actuaries in South Africa contacted you and you started up with that. I'm curious if, uh, is it called the Society of Actuaries? Society of Actuaries of South Africa. What, what's so it called? It's there? called yeah. It's called uh, so the the short name or the abbreviation name is ASA, and that's that's okay. called the Actuarial Society of South of South Africa. Africa. Okay, I looked it up. I couldn't remember the order of the. And, yes. Uh, so, do you know? Like, I don't know a whole lot about uh, the comparison of that society versus like this. I know there's so many societies, but the Society of Actuaries in the United States. Do you know how much overlap there is in terms of requirements and exams or, uh, you know, I know some societies will work together. Some societies don't work together. Do you know much about that? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we've got a, we've got a very good relationship with the UK actuaries. Yeah. Um, and that kind of, you know, we, so we're very good with, you know, India, I think Australia, I think Canada, you know, we, we all kind of, we, we mutually recognizable. So, they value our profession. We value their profession. Yeah. And everyone's quite happy. Um, and we're quite happy with the content. We share notes. We So like points in South Africa, we've been developing the banking actuary. And that's something that's now feeding on to, to the other societies. Okay. However, the Americans, yeah. the Americans, um, and they, look, it might have changed by now. It might have changed yeah. by now. But I remember, I remember, yeah, the big thing is that the Americans don't recognize the South African um, exams or exemptions or profession um, at the same I, level. I tell as you, them. those those darn Americans. <laughs> so, so that's why, like my my theory, and of course I'm biased because I wrote them, but my theory is that that's why the the South African exams are so much harder than the the rest of the world's exams because we're trying to prove to America, yeah. you know, like hey, look, we're smart, <laughs> you know, we we know what we're talking about, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, the one thing where we, I kind of saw that was um, I remember writing Enterprise Risk Management, which was uh, this for the SERA qualification, and that's an international exam. So 
right. you know, the South African fellowship, only the South Africans write that fellowship. And I mean, that one, I flip only passed it on the, the third attempt. And I studied, you know, day and night and gave it everything wow, for that yeah, one. Yeah. Whereas the enterprise risk management one, I kind of read through, you know, the flash notes on AppDead. Yeah. I didn't attempt one pass paper and, you know, I passed it quite comfortably straight away. And that was an international exam versus a South African exam. So that's also one thing that I do get a little bit concerned about. I'm thinking, oh, maybe actuarial science is only hard in South Africa. Well, um, I, or, or, I mean, I don't, I don't have a comparison, but I can tell mm -hmm. you that, I mean, the exams are extremely difficult here too. So if they're hard there, I mean, then I'm, they're I'm very glad, hard. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> if it makes I'm you feel, I mean, you're probably smarter than me, but still, <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, for all the exams, I mean, I had to study. And I'm pretty smart. Like, I'm good at math. That was kind of my mm -hmm. thing. But I had to study at least 300, 400 or more hours for each exam. So it, it, it's pretty challenging here. It consumes people's lives. So it's okay, no, uh, but that, that, that's good to hear. Do you know? Yeah. And I'll tell you why that's good to hear. Because the worst thing is, is you don't want to study, like, like, like you say, so much to get into a profession. And then in other countries, the exams are super easy. Or the yeah, next day, they make yeah. the exams easy. And then everyone's an actuary. And no, and it's, it, yeah. it's not, it's not. And there's so many, like, I can't tell you how many people I know that, uh, you know, that, that stop, stop taking them or just got overwhelmed. Cause it is, it's overwhelming and it can it's yeah. stressful and it's rewarding at the end, but I'm almost like, wow, is it, is it worth it to go through that stress? <laughs> but it's so no, good. It, it, it is at the end. It's just, it's, it's a brutal process. So. Yeah. No, look, I, I cried a lot. I, you know, it yeah. was one way for me to, to get out all those emotions. And yeah. now, like I said, it, it, I was very, very fortunate to have a, a very supportive family. Yes, they were very much saying, you know, you can always quit if you want to. Yeah. But they were very supportive. They were like, you know what, if you need extra time off to study, you know, we can give you a bit of a bridging load. You know, they were, they were very much like, you know, we're going to help you get into this thing. That's good, um, yeah. And if I ever needed like extra textbooks, all these type of things, it wasn't a question of, okay, I need to get a part-time job in order to afford, you know, the act dead notes or, you know, to rewrite these exams because they are expensive. Yes. You know, the parents, the parents were very generous. And, and that is something that I'm very, like, I acknowledge that privilege. And that's why I also see this actual video thing as, you know what? I need to do a little bit of good because so much good has also been done to me by the parents. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, and help kinda, other people. I need, to, yeah, I need to help other people. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's weird, like getting all this extra benefits from having this YouTube channel. It's almost like, no, I don't need this. You know, this is to pay a debt, not to, hey, well, to maybe, get something out of it. Maybe the society <laughs> here in America will, will discover you through YouTube and they'll be like, South Africa is awesome. And they'll start talking to your society because of your YouTube. <laughs> so I, I hope so. I hope so. Cause yeah, well, I, mean, I, I mean, I, maybe, maybe they do talk more by now, but I, I'm also curious, like how big is the society in South Africa is, I mean, is the profession fairly large there or is it kind of a growing profession? Um, I think, I mean, the last time I looked like we, that I heard people discussing numbers, we were around a thousand, you know, a thousand okay, fellow, yeah. fellow actories. Um, but I think that the student members or like the associate members probably puts us maybe at around 10,000, like I'm guessing there. Okay. So yeah, it's, but yeah, so I think we're much bigger when you consider everyone who's got one or two exams or just, you know, is one or two away, yes. but the actual fellows, we quite, yeah, we quite short on those. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because like I say, I've like, I've got another fellowship in, in finance. And that hasn't been as well received as the the Sarah qualification. So the chart oh, really? okay, yeah. that I got for writing uh, the ERM exam, that one, especially with the overseas people, the overseas people are kind of like very, they're like, oh, you're Sarah. Oh, you know, let's talk. Oh, let's do wow, this. Or let's they, do that. So they really value that one. Whereas the fellowship in finance, they kind of like, me and I'm like no, that one was so <laughs> that was harder. <laughs> <laughs> I had to flip and learn everything there is to know about finance because you know the, the way that exam is is you know it's a few topics, but they kind of say we can ask you anything. Yeah, and like yeah. I say, it it took me three attempts to get this thing. Um, so I kind of feel like I know finance well, but everyone's more interested in the risk management or your the basic actuarial skills like programming, you know, the modeling, yeah, um, yeah. discounting cash flows. That's they're more keen on that, and no one's too interested in my 
my financial skills, which that is interesting. Which is sad. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, but that's what I, I, I have. Well, yeah, what it was weird because last year I, I was like, you know what, let me write a book on finance because you know I've got all this finance things, and this was before I met uh, the, the actuary in London. So this was before I knew that you know my life would become so. Like, I mean, I've worked harder this year than I think any other year from a working you know career point of view. I believe it. Yeah. Uh, so. For my goal for 20, because I kind of went through that quarter life crisis, you know, I think you know, actuaries, we, we, you know, got matric, got university, got to get your actuarial exams. And it's like, okay, now what do I do? Right. Um, and that's why it was like, you know, because I, I did work at a corporate for, for 14 months and I didn't enjoy it at all. Yes. So it was always like, you know, do I go back to the consulting? Do I do this? Do I keep making YouTube videos? Do I, you know, be an entrepreneur? And I, I did try the entrepreneur route. Um, some people on my channel remember all the hype coin videos I was making where I was like, I'm going to combine Bitcoin and Facebook and make a social currency. It's just going to be amazing. <laughs> and it was, it was a total disaster. Um, and then hey, was, at least you know, you've then, tried. Yeah, I know. And then I was like, I'm going to get into the Ethereum programming. So I made these decentralized applications. I remember making this thing called Crypto Rose. People could send little you know, love letters on the blockchain. Yeah. And then, of course, the blockchain or the whole crypto universe crashed, you know, at the end of 2017. Yes. So I was sulking for like a lot of 2018, um, going through a little bit of like quarter life crisis, what do I do, all that type of stuff. And I was like, you know what, I know so much about finance because I had passed the exam in, yeah. in May 2017. I was like, let me write a book. So I put together a whole book proposal, sent it off, but they take quite a long time for these book proposal people. And they've only like come back last week saying they've approved it, you know, we, we, can, we can go for it. So it's going to be a busy year because, like I say, I've got this book to write. I've got a lot of actual tech stuff to do. Um, I also want to look at maybe, you know, coming into the insurance market with a little bit of a twist with technology. Um, cryptocurrency is still, you know, and it's, you know, Bitcoin's pumping again. So it's kind of like, oh, some of those old ideas I can maybe bring back and, yes. and look at maybe making like a, a stable coin for Africa and then building financial institutions on top of that. You know, so I've got, I've got a lot of these, these wild dreams. Um, That's awesome. So, yeah, so it's going to be yeah, interesting to see. <laughs> You've got a lot of stuff going though. And on top of all that, you have your Udemy course as well. Can you talk about that a little bit? And I, uh, I yeah. know we're, we're already past, I don't know if you have a couple more minutes. I have a few more questions for you. Yeah. If you got, yeah. got some time. We can, we can keep chatting. Um, okay. No, look, the, so, the, the Udemy course was, was an interesting one because like I said, um, 20, 2017, the first half of 2017, I was studying towards the actual exam. Um, yeah. the, that was the fellowship, Passed the fellowship, then spent the second half of twenty six, uh, sorry, twenty seventeen, like really having a go at this hot coin idea. You know, raising investment, building the app, marketing it. You know, really giving it a good push. Um, and of course, it you know it, it flopped quite badly. So twenty eighteen started, and I was I was very depressed. Like I'm not gonna lie, I was properly depressed. Quarter life crisis. What do I do now? Did, like, what, had you invested you know, a lot into Bitcoin or any of the cryptos? Um, you know what? I was I was fortunate in the sense that, like, I remember back in back in twenty, I started working at, at twenty fourteen for a company, and they had asked me a question. You know, what is Bitcoin? Yeah, and so I was aware of it in twenty fourteen. Didn't know much about it. I just knew I knew it was pirate currency. That's I think that was that as far as my Bitcoin knowledge was back then. <laughs> um, but then everyone would talk about Bitcoin at the you know you know over coffee at the office. So when I left the office in beginning of 2016. Um, I spent you know, a lot of 2016 getting into artificial intelligence. That's when I made my rock, paper, scissors and submitted it to the, the science journal, which they, they published. I was like, nice. this is crazy. Um, I mean, they published it in the same month that I was having my very first art exhibition. So it was quite, it was quite weird. It was like, you know, I'm doing this arty thing and now I'm in the science journal. So that was wow. quite a fun, a fun month. Which I needed because, like I said, I didn't enjoy working, so I needed a little bit of that. Yeah, that yeah. Um, and then I also started reading into to Bitcoin and all that type of stuff. I remember the price was six hundred and fifty dollars, and I was like, oh, "I've missed the boat." That's what I thought. Oh I thought, wow, I missed the boat in this technology. And then it went but up to this, like nineteen thousand. <laughs> it went. Fortunately, though, there was this other coin called Litecoin. There yep. was Litecoin and Dogecoin. So I, I stuffed around a lot with Dogecoin. I was buying Dogecoin, sending it to random people. I think even on some of my YouTube channels, I was giving up Dogecoin and I was 
putting it in these weird betting sites. I think I used Dogecoin to bet on Donald Trump winning the election just because I thought no, the odds were out. I thought because they were paying like times five and I was like, no, he's got like a 50% chance. I was still yeah. shocked when he got the election. So did, um, you win, did you win a bunch of money then? Yeah, so so what? But like, I mean, it was it was the Dogecoin, and it was it was like you know big amounts in Dogecoin, but it was like yeah. just, you know a couple a couple of thousand in South African currency. So, but it was still fun, and that's when I was like, you know what? I sat down with my parents. I said, you know, I want to put a I want to get I want to put a, a sizable amount in this Litecoin. Like, and I said, I know it's this weird technology and everything, but I want to be part of this journey. So I bought a lot of Litecoin at three dollars. Wow. I remember it went it went up to a certain price and I was looking at, you know, like really fancy watches. And my dad was with me at the time. He said, you know what? Sell your sell your stupid coins and get this this watch. Now this was with the coins because I hit a certain threshold. I sold just a little bit. So the coins I had now was just pure profit. Yeah. So he says, sell sell your coins and get get a nice watch. You really want this nice watch. And I was like, you know what? The price is gonna keep going up. And sure as nuts, it did. You know, this is end of 2017. I'm looking at M2 BMWs. You know, it was yeah. like proper, proper stuff. Yeah. And I remember I was such an idiot because I was like, this Bitcoin thing's the future. So I went and I even the money that I'd previously withdrawn, I pumped back into it oh, right wow. at the top. And oh, of course, no. then, and then as the price starts tumbling and going down, I was very much like, oh, you know, buying the dip buying the dip so yeah. i now have too much of the stupid uh, crypto stuff but <laughs> i'm holding and very happy that you know the price is coming back yeah i was gonna say it's going back up again so yeah but it went from being you know like times like a hundred up you know from three dollars because i think like coins hit three three it was over 300. yeah it's 381 i think at one yeah. stage yeah you know so i went from being times 100 to now you know, throwing more and more money into this thing to now only being up like probably about times four times three so with the whole crash now and everything like that so i i, I only bought a little bit of bitcoin kind of like right during the hype time and it went up and then i sold oh, yeah. it and i i made just like a <laughs> tiny bit it wasn't much <laughs> so well, well this is the thing so i was i because I, I, it i couldn't understand all the cryptography like some of the math was a little bit like above my level um and like i didn't really understand mining like that yeah. so i didn't i was very interested in buying a machine to try and do the mining but electrical engineering wasn't my thing and it was like i said it was just a little bit above my my iq but fortunately i could see that this was a cool thing so i did buy litecoin that's and cool. it had done well and that's why i wanted to make my own currency which was a big flop um and then <laughs> so yeah now we come to 2018 and i'm like what do i do now yeah. in 2018 so in 2018, I basically did just two things. Um, to help with the depression, I got a go-kart and uh, started racing nice. that. Best, best cure for depression. Like if you're yeah. ever feeling nihilistic or oh, life's meaningless, you get a go-kart. Get a go-kart, all right. And you compete and it's flipping. You're like living on the edge of life, you know, going like <laughs> 120 kilometers an hour through some of these corners. You're like, oh, you get out and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm still alive. So that, that, was, great for, that was great for the depression. And I actually want to make a, a YouTube video on my karting. I'm just waiting. I'm getting my helmet spray painted, and then I'm going to you, make. A, you should definitely do that. Yeah, make make a little fun video there. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I started doing in 2018 was revisiting some of the other actual subjects that um, I hadn't posted videos on for YouTube that people were requesting. And I thought, you know what? Could I maybe make a profession out of online learning? So maybe you know the YouTube ads aren't very you know they're not going to generate a lot of money yep. but what if i made quality actuarial content and i put it on like a course like udemy and i must say that was probably something else that i, I failed at if i look at my projections you know i was expecting because udemy i think i don't think i even have i mean i've got just under two thousand students on on udemy across all the courses and I was going for, oh, I'm going to get a thousand students a month. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so that's, still, I that's still a good start, though. Yeah. It, and, and I guess these things do take time to snowball and all that type of stuff. But it, that was 2018, was building these Udemy courses, seeing could I progress from YouTube, you know, providing free education so to maybe it, making, yeah. yeah, making selling it where I put more exam walkthroughs and, you know, do a little bit more in-depth videos and spend a lot more time and justify it by saying, you know, I'm going to maybe make a make a living off of this. 
And with Udemy, um, uh, can you explain to our viewers what Udemy is a little bit? So, so Udemy is kind of like um, YouTube in the sense that there's online videos. Uh, the thing is that they, they're behind a paywall, so you have to pay to access them. Um, and they're normally much better organized, and they very much geared towards tutorials. Yes. So in YouTube, if you type in statistics, okay, you're going to get just a whole bunch of everything. Like it's going to be like all over the place. Right. Whereas you type in statistics into Udemy and they'll say, you know, this is, so my course is actuarial statistics, um, which is very much based for the exam P. Oh, that was another thing. In, with Udemy, I also started to factor in the American exam structures as well. Went through American exams. Okay. Because on my YouTube channel, it's mainly just the, the, British, the British ones. Um, and that's because a large chunk of my audience is from the States. Like, uh, the, you know, USA is my biggest cohort, followed very closely by India, and then South Africa is only like fourth or fifth. You know, it's, we are oh, wow. quite a yeah. yeah, quite a small one with the, with the viewers. Um, so yeah, it was trying to you know make this this Udemy thing, and I know there's there's been a lot of requests for people to make want me to make you know the CA one videos again and and do these other subjects, but it's kind of like it's it's interesting as soon as you introduce a price people very hesitant and it's weird whether it's one dollar or whether it's a hundred dollars it's just that whole idea of having to spend money it. yes and, and i know that, that that's something that i've only recently started to overcome like i would never pay for apps i would never you know try pay for subscription services and all of that type of stuff but this year i've started to say you know let me get apple music it's you know that subscription thing let me pay for some quality apps you know when i'm going to play games on my phone let me rather play like the proper ones than yes. play ones with stupid ads popping up everywhere so i've slowly made that transition into you know buying content is actually better because you're getting better content but i remember being a student there was this big resistance and i think that's also the same because my audience is students there is that resistance to yeah. to the paywall um and I don't know, hopefully in time that will, you know, as the years go by, I can maybe start reducing it. But another big problem with the Udemy course is they went and changed the syllabus as soon as I, I, I published it. You know, now there's this yes. big R component. So I need to update it or I need to make a, a, another separate course for that. Right. But what I'm looking at now is rather maybe another approach. And that is like, can I get a corporate to sponsor me making educational videos? Yes, because what happens in that sense is they then tick their box of social responsibility. You know, they've provided funding for education and they're getting their brand out there to an actual audience who potentially could work for them. And oh, then right. what's nice is the corporates are then funding or paying, you know, spending my time to make these things. And the students can then benefit from it, you know, because they are still then getting it for free. So I was going to say the other thing you could try is, uh, if there's, I know, I know you're targeting a lot of students, but some of the people taking that exam are probably already at companies that may be paying for study materials for those students mm -hmm. to take it. So then the student doesn't have to pay and the corporation pays for it. Yes, at least, I mean, at least in the United yeah. States, you know, most companies we work for, they'll pay for study hours, for exams, uh, for study materials. So if they knew, like, if I was taking a st actuarial statistics, I'd be like, oh, I want to take MJ's class. I tell my company and then they pay for it. Like that could be an approach. No, look, and, and, and I think that is definitely, that, that was something that we, we looked at was, you know, if we could tap into to that funding. So remember also here in South Africa, if you work for an actuarial training office, they do subsidize your, your payments. And I think the students that we are selling to do have that kind of vibe. Or okay. they are the older students coming coming in. So like I said, we are making sales. It's just like I said, we've got two thousand overall. Where well, I was expecting a thousand a month. Yes, uh, yes, totally. yes. And and that was the exact same thing with Hypecoin. Was like I was like expecting you know a thousand downloads every week type of thing. Right. And we, if, to to be fair to poor Hypecoin, we were getting those amount of downloads. If you go and look at the app, you know it's got like a lot of flipping downloads. But what apps don't tell you. Is the number of uninstalls you know we got a lot of we got a lot of uninstalls <laughs> yeah. on and that's kind of when i was like yeah this app is because people were like you know why are you killing this app you got ten thousand downloads <laughs> and i was like yeah eight thousand uninstalls you know <laughs> <It's kinda laughs> i don't think the app, 
<laughs> I don't think the market really took the, the app too too well. And then of course the you know I posted um, Hypecoin on the YouTube channel with a bit of a Bitcoin prize. Yeah. And some of the subscribers figured out how to get into the back end of the app and you know started fiddling around with everything and all that type of stuff. Oh wow. So and, and that's why it, it, it was interesting because I was kind of like, you know, in order to make Hypecoin, it was this high frequency payment thing. So I couldn't really put it on the blockchain per se or in yes. the beginning. It was kind of like I wanted to do this hybrid method and actually never got there. But um, fortunately, there has been like a lot of advances in technology. Like I don't know if you can see the T-shirt I'm wearing now. It's this company called Raiden. And I they can, actually... I can kind of see the logo, but I can't really yeah, it's, it's it. a very it's, it's a very... Terrible logo. You can barely see what it is. But yeah. they, I went to, I went to a hackathon, and they've actually created technology to assist with these micro payments um, oh, wow. on the blockchain. So it's weird. There's always this like nagging thought in the back of my head. I'm like, you know, you could, you could resurrect Hypecoin or, or yeah, another yeah. one of these things and and throw it out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, I don't know. It was weird. I always said Hypecoin was going to be the last app I made because I've made. A lot of apps before then. Um, some even got me in trouble. I got I got some legal letters on some because uh -oh. some kid posted something on the app, and then I was sued for defamation because I was the publisher of that. You know, so apps do get you in into trouble, and they wow. are expensive and they are time consuming. Yeah, but um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I said that today. I wouldn't be surprised if two months time you see me on my channel. Hey guys, I'm launching this app. You know, it's. Because it is something that I am very, very drawn to is the tech side of, of life. But, um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully I'll do my homework uh, properly next time and not just be, you know, have a business plan. That's, I think that's the lesson. Yes, have a I business like it. plan. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Have a yeah, risk definitely. register. You know, apply what we learn in natural sciences and just going, <laughs> going for it. Going all in. Yeah. Well, I like, uh, I mean, I like your boldness. You do a lot of different things. And, um, I, I mean, I could go on and on asking you questions, but we're at about an hour here. So I'm going to ask you just two fun questions to kind of end this. Uh, and those are, the first one is, uh, being from South Africa, for anyone going to visit, where's the best place to go in South Africa? Oh, oh by far, by far. That's such an easy question. Um, Cape Town. Cape Town is, it's the jewel of Africa it is absolutely stunning. I mean, we've got the mountains, we've got beautiful beaches. Um, it is just, it's stunning. And we've got wine farms. So it's, you know, you can have fine dining to crazy parties in Long Street. I mean, Cape That's Town, awesome. number one destination in the world. I, you know, I always tell people Cape Town is the best city in the world. I mean, so, I, I hear, I've heard a lot of good things about Cape Town. So I, I'll definitely oh, yeah. have to visit there sometime. And, and that's why I live here. I mean, that's the yeah. nice thing about. So are you, sunset. are you actually living in Cape Town then? Yes. So I live in Cape Town and I mean, this is the lovely thing is you can, as an actor, especially now with the internet and stuff, you can live wherever you want, you know, yeah. you can work remotely. And that's why I choose to live in Cape Town because in my opinion, it is the, the best city in the world. So to everyone that's watching, amazing. come and, come and visit. Yeah. Let me know if you're down here and I'll, I'll take you up a cable card and show you Table Mountain. Sweet. Yeah. Well, if I, if I'm ever there, I'm going to, I'm going to hit you up and we'll grab a drink or something. No, yeah. definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And then my uh, second question for you is, what is your favorite hobby outside of actuarial science? My favorite hobby outside of actuarial science? It, it is weird because it's, it's definitely a toss-up between three things. Um, the one is the go-karting. I mean, I absolutely am obsessed with this go-karting now. That's amazing. Uh, I, even in, I even entered nationals. Um, really? Where I came sick. Yeah, but I came second last. So, um, you know, that, that's, the, that's the thing about karting is that I'm, like, decent. Like, I'm better than the average person. But as soon as I start competing at, like, the national level, yeah. I kind of get uh, taught manners. But karting is, is absolutely a lot of fun. Um, my second biggest thing that I like doing is, is creating, whether that is creating art, uh, writing short stories. I really like being creative. Yeah. Um, like my art's not that good, but at least it's colorful. So, and it's, it's a nice way to like just relax or writing, like especially not even just, so I write a lot of like technical stuff, you know, for the actual tech website and, you know, maybe writing this book, but also like writing just fiction, you know, fun stories, character development, just love creating. And then the third thing is 
I'm obsessed with learning, and I think that's what what helped a lot with Hecturals. Helped me well, get to Hecturals. I see uh, religion, philosophy. Oh yeah, uh, you got a whole stack of books there. This this is this was basically what I did in like I said, yeah, 2018. It was it was go karting. It was making that those Udemy courses. Uh, but every morning, I mean, I try to still do it now, but I'm so busy now. But yeah, I mean, philosophy. It's fantastic. I mean, yeah. the book on religion. That's probably my favorite one. Um, yeah, so I just love learning. I, it's weird, I, and I don't know if it's because we, you know, we studied for so long, we wrote all these exams. But I get frustrated if I don't learn something new in a day. I kind of feel like that day's wasted. You know, yeah, I didn't yeah. Learn something new. So no, yeah, these books are great, and especially what they are—they're just summaries of great people's work. And then, if you're interested in that person, you can then you know go on Google and actually find their proper paper. A lot of them have won Nobel prizes nice. of what they've done. So you're reading good quality. So it's it's a good way yeah. to push yourself to reading good stuff instead of you know your crazy aunt's Facebook status where you're like, okay, I didn't even know <laughs> and, that. And you got a nice little dog on top protecting the books too. Oh yes, the little little corgi. I mean, yeah, I love the corgi and the doge and yeah. And yeah, it's, it's I think this one's been with me all throughout all my YouTube videos. If you go like to back some of the old ones, nice. you can see him see him there. Sometimes even in the thumbnail. And then of course, uh, like my previous videos used to have the doge. Um, stickers, which yep, I actually yep. made. I made those Doge stickers because I wanted to sponsor a Formula One car. I wanted to get Doge oh, really? onto Formula One. That's amazing. We even we even made an app called Doge Pre, where you could race this little Doge. Coin. Like I said, I, I, didn't, I don't know why I was doing that. Um, but now I printed ten of those stickers, and we only we actually printed the one on the Formula One car. There's a video of it somewhere on my channel. Um, I remember I got so excited with the Formula One cars. I posted so many videos in one day. I actually lost subscribers. It's the one day where my subscriber count went down. Really? I think I, I spammed my channel. I got so excited. I was like, Formula One cars. <laughs> You're like, yes. Um, and I put Doge stickers on it and everything. So, wow. so yeah. But um, yeah, that's awesome. That's the little, little. It's it's weird. The the dream, the ultimate dream, is to live on a farm, maybe somewhere in Wales, because corgis they. They've got a lot of fur, so Cape Town's not the best climate for them. Ah, so yeah. I need to find a cold climate, get a nice big farm, and then have corgis. Have a bunch and of corgis. Then, and then just tap out. And then tap out. That's that's me. <laughs> life done. So Man, you have, when you I'm 35. A, you have so many interests from <laughs> go-karting to corgis to math to religion. You're all over the place, man. I like it. So, oh, Bitcoin. Nothing. Yeah. Bitcoin. Well, this this is, I mean, Jim, I know we, we any, but just, like, I guess, a final thought. The one thing I really find interesting about especially by having all these divergent ideas is seeing how they connect, how they yeah. do all these type of stuff. And it's one thing that I am so grateful for with regards to actuarial science is because it places such an emphasis on uncertainty and probability, you take that, you know, set of thinking and you start applying it to religion and philosophy and all these other things. And you do get different results. And like I said, my, my article on philosophy, especially around morality, is coming out in Philosophy Now magazine later this month. Oh, so, wow. and, that, and that is something by just taking what I read here and saying, you know what, I actually disagree with what these guys are saying from an actuarial perspective. Let me write a counter argument. And the Philosophy magazine was like, yeah, we love these contributions. You know, we'll post it and see what happens. That's so, amazing. So I guess, yeah, that's, I guess, a final thought or an encouragement why people should study this amazing subject is that it can help you see different angles of all the other subjects. And that for me has been one of its greatest blessings. Wow, so, yeah. that's, wow. that's awesome. And on that note, MJ, the fellow actuary, everyone. Uh, thank no, you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And like I say, everyone who's watching it on my side, please check the description so that they can see the rest of your interviews. And yeah, definitely get them, get them to your channel as well. Appreciate Perfect. it, yeah. And I, I have a, a lot of great guests coming on, so um, definitely you know, like, subscribe, and go check out MJ's channel. Uh, I have the link below the video also to his Udemy course. He's a great teacher, so I recommend his stuff. Um, I've, I've been following him for a while, so I, I definitely, uh, definitely think you should check him out. And I appreciate you coming on. You're a fascinating guy, so we'll have to uh, stay in touch in the future, and um, maybe we'll do something else in the future. No, perfect. It's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, on my side, it's evening, but I think it's still morning or it, afternoon on your side. Yeah, it's uh, so, 11, 11 a.m. on my side. So yeah, you, so you, yeah, better, so, you better go eat dinner. <laughs> I'm going to get dinner, but you have a great day. Hey, thank hey, you so you much. Hey, you too. Thanks. Perfect. Bye, Cheers. everyone.